What happens when your industry is changing from the outside and it impacts your business, or in this case, uh, automotive dealerships, where the manufacturer is saying, these are new initiatives and you have to comply and you're not sure, well, where do I comply? How do I comply? And more importantly, how does this, these new changes impact my processes internally? What should I do? And that's what we're gonna discuss today with our guest, John Ellis. Welcome today to another episode of You're In Charge, Now What? The podcast that empowers new managers with real world solutions to help them feel more confident and build up their skills as leaders. I'm your host, Glenn Pash, and each week we dive into these types of challenges that managers face all the time, and we're gonna give you some practical strategies that you can implement right today. So as I said, I'm excited. John Ellis, he's a 20 year veteran in the automotive space. He is going to be discussing the concept or the topic of EVs and how that's impacting automotive dealerships. And through that lens, you're going to learn what they're doing. And you can take these tactics and strategies and apply it to any initiative, how to implement it into your business, how to get your team on board, and more importantly, make it work for you. So let's dive into today's episode and let's get started. All right, so welcome to back to another episode of You're in Charge, Now What? I am so excited to have John Ellis with us today. Uh, he is a 20-year veteran in the automotive industry, and he is and a Marine, so thank you so much for your service. I always yeah. uh, have high respect for that. And he's uh, currently leading a company called Bev Everything, focusing on helping automotive uh, really understand the whole EV concept and the whole EV strategy. But the reason why, John, I brought you on and why I think it's important for this audience of mine is this is it's a great lens to talk about change. Uh, right. And when you're in a dealership and you're embracing change, and in this case, it's changed from the outside. It's not as if you internally said, we're going to try a new strategy. This is the manufacturers are coming to you and saying, "We, this is our new initiative. Here's what we want you to do. And now you have to deal with it. So again, I want to really through that lens, get your take on it because you've seen it with adoption of this or fighting back on this or where they're winning, where they're losing. So First off, thank you for being here. And what are your thoughts on this concept of change from the outside? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I love your show. love everything you guys do for our dealer community. Uh, you know, partnering with folks like you, I help get the word out. And to your point, it, it's a word that needs clarification, right? And that is, uh, I, you know, dealers, unfortunately, have been right in the middle of this. If you think about a, a flame in the wind of a candle, and uh, the federal government's involved. OEMs have a ton of pressure uh, from that incentive side of the business, as well as the, you know, the, the ecological side of the business as well. Everybody's trying to find their balance. And unfortunately, our dealer body's stuck right in the middle, right? right? They're, they're, they're in the winds of change. And so uh, to your point, clarity in the chaos is really why we decided to get involved in this business a few years ago. We're very familiar with electric vehicles, uh, owning one for 10 years and then having been in the EV battery space for the last two and a half years or three years before I branched out on my own, uh, we saw the challenges OEMs were facing as they tried to determine what they would clear as a path for their way forward. Tesla's muddied the waters in the last couple of years, but before that, they had a tremendous amount of success, so it looked pretty icing to them. And for dealers, to your point, everything's coming from the outside in and putting so much pressure on what they should do to evolve in this space and how quickly they should evolve. And so what we're seeing right now is a, uh, many dealers are taking a wait and see approach. And what we've tried to do is say, let's take a baby step, crawl, walk, run approach, because it's coming. Um, one of our largest clients and then most favorite clients we learned a lot from is Liza at Carter Myers, Myers Automotive Group. And what she'll tell you, and we believe wholeheartedly is, no matter what the powertrain is, we want to teach our folks to be ready and the dealerships have the resources to train their people and their community and their buyers. And so that was really where we started to focus is how can we help the dealers determine what's right for them, understanding it's a very small piece of their P&L. So we surely don't want to change everything right away 
but how to get started, right. how to create path to that journey. But, but, but let's, you, you touched on something, which I love when my, my guests make my brain think <laughs> really hard on this is that, but it, the, the dealer model in it, in its, the way it's set up is not really easily defined in a way that from like a typical franchise model where everybody inside the store is doing the same thing. So when the change comes from the outside, you know, if a McDonald's changes something, everyone more or less is doing the same thing in the store. So it's easier to say, this is a new sandwich. This is a new product. This is a new initiative. And everyone, you know, sort of falls in line. When we're saying any specific OEM, there's multiple dealerships, which all run potentially differently inside. They have different choices to make. So as you're saying, if the manufacturer is trying to exert this pressure, how much do they have the ability to wait and see or say, hold on, I'm not going to do this, where maybe another dealer is, yes, I'm going to. So I think that idea of change from the outside, you know, when it's out of your control, so to speak, is putting it through the lens of what you do your own process and then understanding what you have the flexibility to push back on. Would, would that be a good uh, framework? Yeah. You know, it, what, what we try to teach in, in our processes is agnostic understanding of the industry first, understanding the cons what the consumers are looking for, uh, building into your process. This is a more consultative approach because our motto is we just want to help sell one more car. And that makes dealers, that puts dealers at ease because to your point, many different processes, OEMs have different offerings. Some OEMs don't even have EVs. And if I'm a dealer going, well, my OEM doesn't have an EV, why should I even care? Well, the point is the EVs are coming in the used car market too. And there's opportunity to take that and build your brand and build your DMS and also build your profitability. So we want to teach agnostic processes at first understanding that the OEM has the responsibility of teaching the vehicle detail training. So the type of vehicle, its longevity, its range, all the things are important. And then their quantity to the dealer body and what they expect of the dealer. So how many charging stations or how many certified techs that need to be on staff. Those things are pretty much undeniable. If you want in, you have to be in. If you don't want in, then you're going to be out. Most dealers choose to be in, but not all. Here's the dilemma. Without taking agnostic, an agnostic approach and say, Mr. Dealer, you have to get ready, at least agnostically, to how to have this conversation and how to train your folks to uh, uh, appraise, recondition, sell, finance, and service any EV that comes through your door. Right Now, typically, you don't service the battery. We get that. But everything else is serviceable and reconditionable. So that being said, that's where we start. And that takes the pressure off of them to go, well, I don't need five charging stations. Well, that's a decision you have to make. And what we found, and you saw here, Glenn, Ford just pulled back on their harsh requirements to the dealer body because they realized, wait a minute, this train has left the station, but the speed is nowhere near where we thought it was going to be. Yeah. So if we stay right in the middle and we help dealers build that process, the training module, and then the leadership accountability to the acumen agnostically, they'll be ready for whatever comes by the brand. See, what I like about that is you're taking that approach of analyzing the change, right? We 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 were joking earlier on uh, before we got uh, on, on camera was, you know, a lot of times industries, not just automotive, but a lot of industries or even dealerships or businesses have a tendency to see a new idea and we run wholeheartedly to one side and then we run a wholeheartedly to the other side, you know, at the time of taping, you know, we're heading to the big national automotive conference or by the time this says uh, airs, we might be past it. But AI is the big buzzword this year. Right. So yeah. it's a new buzzword. But the point is and why I want to talk about through the lens of EV, because you could look at this through the lens of uh, AI or any of these initiatives are. First, what are the requirements from the manufacturer in this case or, or the outside pressure? Mm -hmm. Is it real? You know, do I have to jump in first or can I wait? I have a dealer friend who says I don't want to be anyone's guinea pig, so I'll wait till they you know, work out some of the kinks. And then what I really liked about what you said is you're putting it through the lens of my process. What's good for me within 
reason of what you have to. To your point, I have rural dealers who are going, no one's buying an EV here. Where I have people who are in more metro areas are like, send them all to me. I can't keep them on the lot, right? So it's balancing that through your own process of who you are as a dealership. I think that's really important and I love what you're talking about. So then when you go in and advise, or even if you're looking at people from the outside and they're having casual conversations with you, is that one of the biggest disconnects that you see or mistakes people make is they just blindly just start making changes without putting it through this process of auditing what's right for my team or my dealership? You know, Glenn, that's a great question. The, the, the truth of the matter is the ones that have done that are the ones that have gotten themselves in trouble because they've overspent and they've over leveraged too early, got excited with the OEM, got excited with the federal government. We know how all that works, right? There's a plenty of money to go around, but is the demand going to follow all of that excitement? And what right. we found was demand is a little tapered right now. A lot of it has to do with infrastructure. It's not the vehicle itself. We can get into that another time. But so, yeah, you, it's really important for dealers to do exactly what you said they, sh they should do is taper that process to their internal uh, condition today and understand that if they're set and ready with a foundation from that perspective, they can speed up at any given time. So I, I love that. And that's exactly what we try to do. We don't want them to over leverage to the point where now they have to, um, ha they have to really cover that, that P and L with something else. And they feel really disgruntled about the process. EVs are, are going to be very profitable for them, but right now it's just too small a portion of their P and L to go all in. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it's again, we've seen it through digital retailing. We've seen it through other initiatives where we suppose the demand for something is higher than it is. And again, everybody can speculate. Um, the good thing is some dealers have the flexibility to not have to jump in on it on every initiative right away. But I think it is, it, it, I think, and, and that's why I w love talking to you about this topic is anytime you're trying to put change into your business for whatever it is, it has to be put through the lens of some sort of analysis of demand and really try to really understand the demand in your market because demand at a high OEM level is taking into consideration, you know, an average, which is, could be, as I said earlier, a metro area will sway heavy and you're going to, and so if I'm required to do something here and I have no demand, I'm going to fight back on that because it doesn't fit. But if you don't, like you said, then if I just run to it and say, sure, we're going to do this big investment, all of a sudden my P&L is out of whack because I've spent money and there really is no demand in return. So when you go in then from you and, and the reason why I want your perspective on this is that someone internally could be in charge, very similar mm -hmm. to what you're doing. Someone, you know, I recommend always bringing in sometimes experts from the outside because they don't know what's going on in the store and they can ask maybe the, the obvious questions that everybody didn't ask. Mm -hmm. But what would you say, how would you recommend to someone who's someone who's internally saying, I'm going to be in charge of this? I have to manage this change. What would what would you recommend from things that you do to say to them, well, if you're going to handle this, here are two or three things that I would do first in order to understand what the demands or the pressures are going to be on your organization? Yeah, great question. No, I, it d definitely depends on the size of the organization. But the first thing you want to do is build the structure, right? So understanding that if you're a single rooftop, and you want to be what we call the EV champion, whether it be in a leadership position uh, or it'd be a staff position with a leadership sponsor, or in the case of like Liza and, and many others we work with, you build a kind of a corporate structure down to uh, rooftop structures, right? So each rooftop would have a, 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 a manager sponsor with a champion or two inside the rooftop. It's really that simple. You want to make sure that what, and at whatever level, so let's just take the rooftop level, uh, there is at least one or two people in there that spend that time in a career path type design position to learn what's important. If you remember uh, years ago, Hyundai came out with this high-end uh, models and it created a space in the dealership where there's a concierge 
platform where you would only be able to learn about this vehicle, make model trim at that station of the dealership. Mm -hmm. Now we're not asking to do that, but we'd like to have that level of expertise in each rooftop for um, the electric vehicle so that when other conversations happen with people that aren't educated, they can be the fill-in or, you know, what we call the champion for growing the acumen for everybody in the store, but giving the best customer experience possible. Because what we don't want to have happen is I say, I want to be the one that leads. And then you are the only one available in the store. And let's say you're not there that day, or you just don't have time to be abreast of the latest information for that make model trim, or even just in general EVs. Someone comes in the store and, and they ask questions that we have no answer to. And we really look clueless and lack the confidence. That's when we lose even the intender that's an ice buyer anyway. Right. What we want to do is make sure that the, even the intender, the curious, they probably aren't ready for EV, or if they are, they, they need to be qualified just to make sure it's the right EV for them. And then you have no clue how to do that. So I really think building uh, a, a kind of a structure at the store group or group level so that you know, okay, this is how we're going to learn and hold ourselves accountable to what we learn so we can execute. I, I love that. And and I hope for those of you that are listening, I, 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 I like pausing at times to be able to uh, mm -hmm. focus on something that the, that the guest said, but like John said right here is that champion isn't just a selfish, and this could apply again to any new initiative or any current initiative that's going on in your, in your business or dealership where you're the advocate, you're the one who's responsible to know. So you're going to learn, you're going to read, you're going to uh, listen in on all the webinars from the manufacturer, but it's how do you then dispense that knowledge out to everyone. It doesn't mean everybody else has to be that expert, but we then have to come up with a structure to allow that information to flow to others in an easy, easily digestible and usable form. So to your point is, I can't be the bottleneck where I'm the only person who knows about EVs in the whole building versus everybody knows enough to have conversations, but if they need an expert and I'm here, well, let me bring my expert over. And I think that also then allows that expert to help disseminate that information and partner with the marketing company to say, how are we putting this information out on the website so that customers see us as the EV expert? Our website is an information hub, let alone internally. So I really like that. So again, folks, for any types of change, whoever's that, that advocate, we have to take it that next step and say, you're not just the educator, the, the person who's learning, you have to be the educator and or distributor of information to our team. I really like that a lot. Yeah, we call it train, you know, train the trainer rooftop. Like you're the rooftop champion, and it's uh, worked out really well for the groups that employed that uh, structure. So, when you're through through now, let's say your 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 engagement, and and I want to move towards sort of this idea of implementation, right? So, someone brings you in, and you're you have all these ideas, and we're starting down the road of this. Where are some of the biggest hiccups? Where are the biggest obstacles, either from um, people buying in from at, at the frontline level or from uh you know PL level where where people are who the keeper of the books are like we're not doing this you know so where are you seeing the biggest obstacles for adoption of these types of initiatives and then secondly how do you get through them so if somebody's listening here and saying well great uh, this all sounds good but I know when I'm going to try and implement this I'm going to get pushback so where are those obstacles and what would you recommend to them as tactics to get through the obstacle? Yeah, so um, I guess it, it would be at different levels, right? So one of the things that we find challenging is most of the organizations we begin working with have no clue where to start. Mm -hmm. And so defining what works best for them, we've kind of talked about it. What's my personality as a group or a region or a rooftop? And then how do I get started? Now, some, some of the progressives have already started and then they're, they're a little easier to work with, but the ones that haven't, the biggest thing is everything that we're hearing in the news today is are pulling people back from making decisions. So EV adoption is slowing, day supply is growing on inventory on lots, uh, prices are dropping rapidly. So retention values are, you know, tanking and all of the things that would make my, uh, 
the thought process as a dealer is I don't want to be involved in that. It's, it's just way too volatile. Uh, how long can I wait before I get started? And that's the biggest barrier I think we have. And so the way we help dealers find their way forward through that thinking is really looking at logical, regional, and you said macro, micro data from the macro data in their market and in their nameplate, show them the commitment of the OEM, the brands that are coming out, what their market demand looks like, and then what the overall consumer demand and the industry looks like, and then balance that with, okay, we can see that even though you're hearing all of this information about ED slowing, it's still going to be part of our business and 24, 25, and even into 30, almost 20% of our business. Some projecting 30%. I doubt it'll be that high. But to this point, we're already almost at 11%. And getting them to really thinking, okay, it's only a half a percent of my PL, but in my region, it's a 3%. It's projected to be 5%. And get them to think, okay, I don't want to be when it's 10% at 0%. Right. And the second part of that is brand loyalty. Think about this one. This is really important. Dealers have spent so much time building their brand and their loyal customer base that we want to make sure that if we get that one or two EV this year, maybe you're in a rural market, you're only going to sell one or two. And when you do, we sell it right because you can deteriorate CSI and brand loyalty so fast with an EV, so much faster than when an ice engine if you sell it to the wrong person with the wrong expectations because we didn't know what we were doing. They'll write letters. They'll tell their neighbors. They'll be so disappointed in the vehicle, which translates to the relationship they have with you for selling the vehicle. And what we do is work with dealers to say, if that was the only reason alone that you want to get started today, let's build brand loyalty faster and better than we ever can without deteriorating it at all. What I love about what you just said, and it, and it makes so much sense, is go, going back to what I'd said earlier, is we have a tendency to run from one side. You know, a few years ago, everybody wants to buy a car online because Carvana showed up. And then we just okay. got the news yesterday yeah, at the time of this recording that Vroom is shutting down and they were one of the people who were going to take over the world. And it's just everybody ran to, well, we need to sell cars online. Then really now it's maybe eight to 10 percent want to do it fully online. But you still have to be prepared, as you said, that we've now expanded the way someone may want to purchase a vehicle. People still want to come in or someone wants to We've now extended it backwards to say, well, you don't have to come in to buy it. So what does that look like? There it might be a smaller and maybe over time more, who knows? But the fact is, to your point is, is you've made it available. So same thing with EV, even if I'm selling one or two. So what I took from it for that person who's saying, how do I get through the obstacle is start small. Don't try to eat the whole cake. So then say, well, what if we all just learn about EVs? Let's learn about our brand's EVs. Let's understand what if. Let's play, if we're not doing it, let's play the what if scenario so that we start strategizing and thinking about it. And maybe if we're not going to do one right now, we spend the next six months learning about the EVs and learning about all the questions, answering all those questions. So when we start to turn it on, we already have some understanding. We didn't lose six months. And that's what I heard most from you is we didn't lo lose time learning. Just because we didn't start playing yet doesn't mean we didn't learn the rules. We didn't understand it, right? And then we slowly get into it where maybe we will sell one model or to your point is we sold one, but we did it right. And so you can accelerate that process instead of trying to jump into the pool. And that's where I say, learn from the mistakes that we've made or potentially your dealership made over the last two, three, four big initiatives or big sweeping changes that were supposed to transform the industry and didn't, or it settled into a normal number or a per, some sort of percentage. So mm -hmm. I, I really like that idea of starting, I think you said it before, crawl, walk, run, you know, and I, and I love that. So a couple other questions as we we pivot down here. So if you're, you know, when you're helping and you're seeing this initiative from the outside and they're trying to implement that, are you seeing that people are making the same mistakes in terms of assuming their team has it all 
locked down without really consistently training on it. And thus we expose ourselves to mistakes since it's constantly changing. You know, are you yeah. running across people going, okay, we did our three months of training. Good. We all know everything about EVs. And then it's pivoted so quickly. So, so are, are you seeing that? And is it part of your, your training or your engagement or even just your philosophy that it's, that's why you need the champion to pay attention to of uh, these new changes in evolution so you don't miss something? Yeah, it's, it, it, you're spot on. That's exactly what we're seeing because what's happening is uh, they'll have their annual training or their leadership training, and then that'll be it for the year. And we'll, it's really what's allowed us to uh, build stronger relationships with our clients is we have a, uh, a training program that is uh, twice a year in person, but then every month we have a EV Champions community get together virtually every month. We train on a topic of the day and then we have homework, we have role plays, and then they come back and they train us on what they learned. And when they get their stamp of approval, they go and train their team. So they they get the opportunity on a Monday morning sales meeting to talk about what they learned and do a quick role play. So everybody can learn in the rooftop, in the region, in the group, what these few people learned on this intensive training that we do monthly. So as you know, Glenn, the news cycles change like the wind. So we're hearing right now we're in the winter months of how horrible EVs were, but before that it was residual values and it'll be something next month. And they need to hear truth, not fiction, as Brooke Furness would always say, about what really is the truth today. So I can not only know myself and have confidence, but if someone asks, I can say, here's some data, some facts, Here's some sources to go learn some more on your own so we can get emotion out of the way and clear the path to truth and fact. And then then what we love to do is train on how to have the consultative conversation, what we call the ED interview, to determine if it's a right fit. And if it's not, we don't sell the car. Right. If it's a good fit, then we take it one step further and we train on uh, lifestyle changes that the EV is going to require for you to have a great ownership experience. And building the Q&A section on our website for self, for really self-accountability of the EV owner when they leave the dealership to go, oh, I remember they said something about range. Let me check that Q&A section. If I don't get it, I'll call John back. And that way you really surrounded your ownership experience on EVs by first determining if it was a good fit and then supporting them all through their life. Life ownership journey. Yeah. What I loved also about that, and and, and for those of you listening, um, if you're the person who's distributing this or if you're the leader of your organization, because we have a lot of our audience are the leaders, is that idea of implementation. Because just having your one training, we're all hyped up, uh, and then you go back to your day-to-day -day work. Well, how do how do I roll the disseminate this information out to people? How do I make it useful? How do they make it part of their work day. And I love that idea of you having that monthly training and then helping them disseminate that information down into there so that it you get you get two-way conversation where I'm pushing this down into the team, but then they're giving you feedback to say, well, here's a question a customer asked me or here's a situation. And then that person then also then has an area uh, or an arena to go back and get feedback from, which is your group and the other people who are in the group who can say, oh yeah, we had that question too. Here's how we answered it. So it's a resource up and down. And I really like that because I agree with you. I think one of the biggest problems or disconnects when I'm working with groups is this idea of implementation. The idea sounds great, sounds great in the classroom, but then who's going to help make sure it, it trickles down into the day-to-day? -day? How do we implement it into their current processes if it is going to change? How do we make sure it's happening versus we just assume that because we talked about it in our classroom and everyone went, sure, John, we got it. And all of a sudden you're scratching your head and a month later you're going, yeah, I think we talked about that or I think we did that or didn't we used to do that? It, it, it can be very frustrating. So I love that idea of change. So um, one other question on this and then we'll we'll wind up because I really, and, and I do appreciate you taking the time. I love this conversation. Um, I've always wondered for your perspective now, because you've been in EV, why did more manufacturers not... Uh, lean in more to hybrids before making the jump to full EVs? Because as myself, as a consumer, you know, an EV is a big commitment. You know, I've had friends who have it. They, 
They use it as their second vehicle, their, their local vehicle, but they, you know, maybe they got solar panels or they had to reconfigure uh, the battery or the charging. And that meant, uh, you know, uh, had to spend money on reconfiguring their, the whole electrical system in their house to be able to do this. And it was such a big commitment. And while they love it, they're frustrated where other people who have the hybrids, they're very happy. They're like, well, listen, once it hits a certain number, then it's it's gas and I don't have to worry about it. I can go get gas and I don't have to worry about charging or sitting here for hours. So what what what's your thought or what have you heard? Why? It just didn't make any sense to me ever. Yeah, you know, we uh, we see the hybrid as the gateway to the full battery electric. Mm -hmm. It's a good fit for a lot of people, especially those that have that fear of anxiety, range anxiety and being stranded on the road. You know, I think... The simple answer is Tesla paved the way, right? Um, having vehicles in market now for almost 15 years with a lithium ion battery in it, the batteries actually perform very well. Reliability has been there along with um, durability. And then of course the resale value until just recently uh, was pretty darn strong. So manufacturers with government help, again, I'm a financial economist. So you can imagine I'm conservative fiscally. I don't like the government to get too involved in our private uh, business, but they did. And uh, in doing so, it was under the guise of climate change. And so I think what you found is just a perfect storm to say P the, what we call PHEBs, the plug-in hybrids are just not satisfying the climate change aspect of the government handing out right. uh, incentives. And so it brought manufacturers to a place where they said one of two things. And having been in the battery world for a while, too, I saw that the mineral scarcity was scared, was scared OEMs. And they're like, look, COVID taught us that we have to have control over our supply chain. And, and just-in-time manufacturing was the reason we got in trouble because chips were part of that. We don't buy them until we need them. We don't make them until we need them. And so guess what happened? When we needed more than we needed, they weren't there to be right. made. So. I think they thought that through. COVID taught them that they need to own battery manufacturing or partner in that self-manufacturing battery assembly part of the business. And so it was a perfect song for them to say, okay, the money's there. The governments are pushing it. Tesla's done it well. I'm going to jump into the fully battery electric space and let the ones that already have the PHEVs, the plug-ins like Toyota and Nissan, they can continue down that path and we'll see how it works. And if you look at any of the projected S&P trajectories, um, all the big bank houses, PHEVs do not grow anywhere near BEVs grow over the next five years. So it looks like it was a smart bet, but we definitely find that PHEVs are plug-in hybrids are a significant gateway opportunity for right. those that are still Yeah, yeah, and that's the way it made sense to me is that it's a nice stepping stone instead of jumping Certainly. to, you know, so again. All right, well, great. So, um at the end of every episode, I like to talk, uh, ask a few questions about the individual that are completely off, but around the this idea of helping leaders and managers grow. So in terms of your journey, what was one of the best pieces of advice leading teams that you ever received? Oh, wow. I've had some amazing leaders. Um, you know, the ones that you remember are the ones that wanted to understand you before you understood them. The ones that, the ones that created the value in me being part of their team, right? And so I've read books like First Break All the Rules, Simon Sinek's books are all really good ones. But if you, as a leader, your job, if you brought somebody into your team or if you've taken over a team with people is to build a safe space for them to be able to um, go out, out of the box and be who they were really designed to be. And that creativity, those talents, that, uh, that stretchability, we call it, without fear of reprisal, even if you make mistakes, as long as you're doing it with good intentions, is where leaders thrive. And I've had leaders that have done that for me, allowed me to stretch in current roles, and it brought more value to the team and to them as a leader. Uh, and I've had leaders that do the opposite, just kind of just trying to stuff you back in the box. Right. So I think that's a big good a good quality as a leader I try to emulate. I love that. I love that. We've had a couple episodes about that, how to, you know, communicate with your team, understand who your team is, where they want to go, and and empowering them at, like a good coach, which is 
help them achieve mm-hmm. the potential that they have. Okay. Next question is, if you were not in this industry, what would you be doing? That's a tough one. You know, I love the coffee guys. Uh, got Thank God for automotive. I was in telecommunications and technology for 18 years before automotive. Um, and I probably would still be there if we didn't have that uh, that big crash in automotive and I mean, excuse me, in telecom in 2000 that led me into automotive. But um, technology would probably be the other place because I love, uh, you know, the, the things that innovate and grow and change. But fortunately, in automotive, I get to be in that space as well in the guise of an automotive industry. Love it. Love it. All right. Two more questions. One is what is a talent or a skill that you have that nobody would really think you have? Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, my wife would probably say that I'm not very good at this, but I think I am, is <laughs> reading other people's language that they're not speaking. So um, when someone's speaking or their body language or just the atmosphere around them, I can interpret that very well. So uh, I can pivot, right? And understand I'm not getting through or right. they're not saying what they really mean. So I ask them more questions. Uh, you know, almost um, intuition, right? It's, I'm sure many people have it, but it's something I've recognized later in life that if I use correctly, I can connect better with people. Awesome. Love it. All right. Last question is, out of everything we've talked about, and again, great conversation, I think really helpful. What's the one thing you would hope that the audience took away from this conversation? Oh, that's a good one. That's an easy one for me. That uh, you don't have to be all about EVs to be ready for EVs. It, electric vehicles are here. They're not going away. Tesla's proven that it can be part of our ecosystem, but it doesn't mean that you have to be all in. Just take, get started, sell one more car. And that's what I hope you took away from today is we can help you. There are other partners out there that can help you just figure out the best way forward for your dealership. So don't stay away from evolving and transforming because you think you're being asked too much or you have to commit too much. Just take the first step. We'll be glad to help you if we're your partner, but there are many out there that can help you as well. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, listen, John, thank you so much for being here. So Tell everyone where they can connect with you online, what you're doing, how do they, where do they learn more about your company, uh, and we'll put it all in the show notes, but tell them right now. Yeah, great. So you can go to www.bedeverything.com. In there, you'll, you'll have a, a chat feature, but you can also join our EV community. Now, that's a free resource for consumers and dealers with training material, resource material. Uh, we also have uh, private dealer areas in there where they train and learn on their own. Plus, you can just email me at john at beveverything.com as well. So we'd love to hear from you. Just uh, find out where you are on your journey and uh, see how we can help. Great, great, great. Well, again, I really appreciate you being here. This has been a great conversation. I love the fact. And audience members, you know the drill. So please make sure, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Click the subscribe, the like, the notifications. We're here every single week. Our goal is to bring great conversations to help you become the leader that you want, build your skills, help fill in your gaps. Uh, As always, make sure if you found value from the conversation John and I had, please share it out with your network. I'm sure there's people who could benefit from that. And as I say at the end of every episode, you're in charge, but now John gave you a few more things to fill up your toolkit to help you become the leader that you want to be. Thanks again. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. John, I look forward to seeing you as well. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you.